Monday, June 1st, Berlin Select Board regular scheduled meeting to order. Uh, with us tonight is Justin Lawrence, Flo Smith, John Quinn. Thank you, Dave. John <laughs> Quinn. Sorry, John. And myself, Brad Town. Um, with us also is Dana Hadley, our town administrator, and Diane Isabel, our town treasurer. Um, Let's see here. Additions or changes to the agenda, David? Yes, please. I'd like to add um, a short discussion on the letter to Central Vermont to support Central Vermont Fiber's um, mission to apply for a grant. And I'd also like to add a discussion on tapping trees in the town forest. Okay, uh, treasurer's report. I mean, I mean uh, public comment. Harry none. Treasurer's report. Okay. Um, each year, well, we talked about the fact we do have credit card payment. People can make credit card payments to pay their taxes and utilities and birth certificates. Last year in 2018, it was probably about eighty thousand dollars, and this year in 2019, it was one hundred nine thousand four hundred dollars that people paid through credit cards or e-checks. The majority of them being e checks, and e checks are $1.95 each. So 71,000 of those e checks. I have more and more businesses that are using the credit card, and the e checks especially. So I thought just interesting news because every year it's just been going up and up and up. And now that more and more people are aware of it and able to go online, I think that it's just, it's a really good, it's good for us, I think, because it works really well and we don't pay the fees, they pay the fees. Is the e check the same as like the A? Is it AHC payment where it's just they put in their bank account and routing number and it transfers? I believe in. that's what it is. Yeah. Okay. The, the yeah. fee for that's a dollar ninety-five. That is the that is the most uh, effective to me and the least amount of fees you're going to pay. Economical. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Wonderful. Oh yeah. yeah. But it's mostly businesses that do that, which is interesting. More and more of the personal property taxes are paid through that, which is really really good. So that's all I've got for that. Well, we're going to leave that again. Mm -hmm. Um, auditor's confirmation of understanding letter. This is the um, boilerplate letter that we sign every year um, about the understanding of how the audit is going to occur. Um, we are in the second year of a three-year contract with Father Gill, Sagali, and Valley. Uh, the cost of the audit this year is $14,000. This would be to audit FY20. Um, we do not need a single audit this year, and um, there's nothing unusual about this letter. It's, it's what we do every year. It's 14.5, right? Did I say 14? It's 14.5, I'm sorry. It was 14 last year. I think is what I'm thinking of. What will be next year? Um, I think it was. One up to 15? I can tell you in one second. Well, have you seen this yet? Mm, no, not that one. No, I had to stop and think for a second. Thank you very much, John. <laughs> it's still going up 500 a year. Yeah. Next year, we probably will need a single audit in FY21 because of the. Um, but, it to, but it has to be 750000 It has to be grants at this point in time. Oh, it may not be then because I don't think the sewer division is getting any grants. Mm -hmm. Okay. Not at this point. All right, well, not that we know Justin, of Justin, anyway. did you see this yet? Mm -hmm. You did. Thank you. Thank you. So this needs to be signed by Brad and myself. So this is the third year we have? Uh, this is the second year. Well, actually, we had them for three years. Yes. So this, so this is the year. second year of the latest contract. So actually, it's our fifth year with them. Do we go out to RFP for that? Yes. Okay. Yes. Do we usually do it for a three-year yep. stint? Yeah. Uh, 
guess probably a motion to sign that. So I guess what I was looking for is if you could just have a motion to approve it. Yeah, yeah well, we approve uh, <coughs> a lot of things. Probably most of the valley and valley and have been on Brad sign for the board. I second that motion. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. Uh, Kathleen. This is Kathleen coming in now. Oh. Hello. Hi, how are you? Okay. We're trying to social distance as best we can, so either you or Matt can be on either side. How about that? I'll just be back here. Okay. All right. Well, then why don't you go over here, Kathleen? Okay. Kath, you know Matt, uh, who is our representative to the um, Central Vermont Solid Waste District. This is Kathleen, who you've met before as well, Kathleen Jen. It's been a little time. But and uh, it's been a little while. And I understand Kathleen is executive director? General manager. General manager. Thank you. Um, and so they've come to... Um, discuss some things with you. You did have their um, um, material that Kathleen provided. And what is new in the wide world of recycling? Uh, well, our district uh, is poised to to uh, construct or find a property for a household hazardous waste uh, facility. We uh, got a $500,000 grant from the state of Vermont. We had, uh, we've been looking for quite some time and, and planning and setting aside funds so that we could do this type of facility having a, a, a year-round household hazardous waste facility has been something that residents and businesses for years have been encouraging us to uh, to seek out and make happen. And so with this $500,000 grant and our own board's commitment of uh, over $500,000 of our own funds, reserve funds, $594,000 actually. That gets us very close to having enough funds to actually make it happen. We know we have a little more grant writing and grants to receive. Um, and, we, and we do intend to go forward with looking at properties, including uh, in the areas of Barry, Montpelier, Berlin, East Montpelier, for just the right site for our facility. Uh, we expect this whole project will take a couple of years, and we're hoping to open the facility in the spring of 2022. Um, so we wanted to just meet with you, see what questions you might have, um, and just do a general check-in uh, about our activities and services, and just uh, talk about this and a few other things. Yeah. Um, for the people listening to us, can you take and describe household hazardous waste? Sure. It's really any material that um, is considered dangerous, that the things that you do not want to have end up in the water system in our streams and, and water resources um, or uh, are dangerous to people, pets, etc. So it can be automotive types of products, cleaning products, um, you know, really anything that has poison, toxic, uh, any of those types of labels on the material. But Primarily things that you find in your household for occasional or everyday use that um, are difficult to get rid of because they are uh, considered dangerous. Does that mean anything from what, uh, pesticides to batteries or 
Uh, batteries would not be considered household hazardous waste. Uh, we have other programs for batteries, but um, we certainly pesticides are a major yeah. type of household yeah. hazardous waste. But now, is this facility also going to take medicines? We might be in a position to do that. Right now, we um, we just coordinate with the police yeah. collection efforts. Um, it, it could be that we really haven't talked about that, but. It's possible that this will be located in an area where we can expand to do other kinds of programming uh, beyond ha household has this place, but that's what we're, our focus is now. But I think, I think Brad, that the, the impetus for, for doing this is the household has this waste need. Yeah. But once you contemplate building facility, then you can look at what other activities you can add to the, to the footprint, to the without uh, weighing it down too much or without causing problems for uh, flow of people or trucks or other things. So the core of it, the, the motivation of it, is the hazardous waste. And then we're going to look at our programming to see what can make sense to add to the footprint in a way that doesn't overcomplicate things or cause concerns for the various constituencies that we work with. What type of facility is it? Is it like a <clears throat> is it a hub? Is it like storing stuff there and then relocating it somewhere else? How does that work? That's right. Uh, we will accept materials, store them there, and then work with a hauling contractor to take the materials and then safely handle and dispose of them. This is something that we do several times over the course of the summer in a mobile fashion. But that means that we don't have any place to service people's needs throughout the year. So um, this is something that the district has a lot of experience with. We know how to do this in terms of gathering and getting it safely to the right people. So we wouldn't have to necessarily learn how to do that. But by having our own facility, we can then learn a lot more about how to service the community and how to continue to do it safely. I did want to uh, mention also that this year, uh, because of COVID-19, at one point we had to put a hold on all of our seasonal events. We, we have five each year. And uh, happy to report that we, had to, we only had to reschedule one, but the other five we we're going to be able to um, have take place in different parts of our district in the coming uh, months. So definitely want to let you know that Berry Town, which was one that was postponed from April, is now going to be held August 1st, which is, uh, I know, a, a popular location for folks from Berlin. And also in uh, Montpelier, the last event of our season is September 26th at the Department of Vermont, Department of Labor parking lot. So those are the two that are closest for you folks, and I hope that you'll continue to um, attend those. Um, it's possible when we have our facility in a couple of years that we would no longer offer one or both of those, and we're um, we're looking at because uh, because of the proximity of the permanent facility, we're not sure that we would need to have all the seasonal events. So I did want to just. Let you know, and if you have thoughts about that, we certainly want to hear from you about those. How do you measure your program? Is it by number of people that come in? Is it by pounds? Is it by liquid gallons? How do you? Um, how do we know if we're getting more and more every year? Are we getting less and less every year? Is it staying consistent? Well, we look at we look at both. We look at we look at uh, numbers of participants in events, and then also. Um, usually it's liquid, so we're looking we're looking at uh, volumes in terms of weight. Do you recall off the top of your head over the past? Well, it comes in two parts really. One, have you expanded the number of uh, events that you hold, and two, have you seen an increase over the years in the number of gallons and the number of participants, or has it kind of gone down as you hold more and more of them? The numbers 
uh, we've we've steadily for at least the past eight or nine years had five events, so that hasn't increased. The numbers have gone up and down. Last year we had more participation and higher volumes at every event. Um, so it really, it, it is something that, that is important to the public mm -hmm. and uh, that people want to have in place. We, we have a lot of numbers about what it looks like year over year in terms of the number. We keep very careful track of the number of people who come and where they're coming from and how much comes in. It's, and the, the contractor who hauls it away has all those numbers. And what we see is sort of ups and downs, as Kathleen's saying, because um, the law may change or there may be some something going on. And, or may, maybe, I think one year we didn't have an event. And so then there was you could see it sort of pent up demand. It, it definitely ebbs and flows in a way that makes it different than it's not like a marketplace. You know, it's not like you, you use up everything or you want to build over time. It's more like you can see that the service is needed because people come back in different ways and different times in different configurations, but they keep coming. And clearly there's a need for the service. I mean, one of the problems a few years ago was that the lines were too long. And so we, we needed to figure out how to make it so that people wouldn't get frustrated or turned away or clogging up the, the logistics of it. So. Um, it's a constantly evolving sort of situation. I, from my position on the board, it's seeing staff deal with it. It's, it, it's, it's something that we have to keep adjusting year over year. Last year, uh, in particular, there were a lot of pesticides that people brought to the events. And the state of Vermont and solid waste districts were really uh, helping to educate people about the dangers of pesticides, and we think that, that that has had a role in people trying to bring those to events and, and maybe find alternatives to using pesticides. And one last thing I'd add, so this is something that the district has been working up to, or think not working up to, but thinking about for a while. So one of the reasons why we have funds on reserve is because we've known that this is something that the state was going to want us to do, that our, our various towns, how many towns do we serve, 19? Yeah. The 19 different towns are strung out through the central region. They've asked us to do this. So we've been saving up, knowing that there was going to be something like this that really had to happen, whether it was this or the combination of the need to respond to the, the new, not so new, recycling and, and waste reduction guidelines that are really coming into effect now. All these things, we knew that we were going to have to build something at some point because there was just no way around it. And so we've been sort of circling around and coming to it. And now the state's provided some significant funding that helps us get over the financial hump. And, and other things are happening. That it just seems like it's, it's a good time to do this. So we have work to do to figure out exactly where and how. But staff is working on it. And we'll have more for you in the next three to six months once more of these things get worked out. Uh, question not so much with the uh, hazardous waste or anything, but um, the state was going to require uh, composting. What is happening with that? Uh, well, right now we're poised for uh, a state law, the last part of Act 148, to go into effect July 1st, which is to ban uh, food scraps and other composables from the landfill. And that law is scheduled to go into effect. There have been uh, various discussions and testimony in different committees, uh, but all indications are that that will be happening. And our solid, solid waste district, along with the state of Vermont, and lots of other folks are trying to help people understand what that means and um, then educate people. I don't think the state has any intention of going right to enforcement, but uh, really just helping people to understand, um, yes, this is in place now, and there are different ways that you can keep your food scraps out of the landfill, and uh, helping people uh, take that turn to make that happen. Um, 
I did want to talk just for a couple more minutes, if we have, have that time, sure. about um, the ARC, the Additional Recyclables Collection Center in, in Barry City. I don't know if folks have been there, but uh, we take a lot of materials that cannot be um, recycled in other ways. So it's, it's not those materials you put in your, your blue bin container, but other types of materials. We, um, closed for a couple months with COVID-19, but we are now open again. We are taking um, paint, batteries, bulbs, computer and TV electronics, and food scraps there. And uh, we hope by the middle of the summer that we'll be taking a lot more of the materials that people um, count on us to take at the art. So did want to let you know about that. What about uh, film plastic? Um, we aren't are not taking that now, but um, I expect we will be taking that again as we have been in the middle of the summer when we when we open up more fully. Good. I was asking my wife has sawdust bags, plastic sawdust saw bags. Yeah, we should be able to take take those. They have to be clean. Yeah. Um, and then we are doing curbside sales of compost equipment because our office, our main office in Montpelier is still closed to the public, but we've been doing weekly curbside uh, compost sales at our location in Barry City at, um, at the Ark. And um, we have another one of those scheduled next week. Our website has all the information about it at uh, cbswmd.org. And uh, we will continue to have these curbside sales as long as people are interested in buying the compost equipment. So that uh, really was, just wanted to let you know, we also have uh, quite a variety of, of seminars and uh, videos on our website. We, we um, usually have on-site workshops, but um, those are on hold right now. So staff have been busy doing all kinds of, of webinars that you can get right at our website. So I just want to let you know about that. That's the, 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 one of the only sort of upsides is that so over the last couple of years, the district staff have done a huge amount of work to set up workshops and get things out in the community, whether it's in schools or in with senior centers and with clubs and master gardener programs, all these different things. So they've been really out there in the community. And they've been so busy, they haven't had time to do the online version of these things. Well, so now they've had a chance to do more of the online stuff. And uh, once things open up again, I think next summer, we're gonna have a really, really robust program that's both in person and online because it's been it's been a really, a really strong point of the district over the last couple of years. And, so we're making, like all the other organizations, we're making the best of it and trying to do what we can to move things into virtual and online, and, and then we'll have both when we can do both. Okay. Uh, any questions for Kathleen or Matt? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I'm interested to know how COVID has affected your budget. Well, right now um, we have seen maybe a slight decrease in our revenues mm -hmm. um, and we're looking we're taking a very hard look at our expenses for fy 21 and really trying to do everything that we can to um, pair those back so that we'll be ready with uh, as, as balanced a budget as we can once we once we get into uh, next year so that we're ready if our income does Decrease. So, Kevin, what percentage comes from tipping fees or income? Um, well, tipping fees, fees or other kinds of fees, about 80%. Right, so the vast majority of the district's income comes from how much garbage is tipped. So when the construction goes up and down, when home improvement goes up and down, we can see these things in our budget. And people don't really know there's actually been some increases in some construction work, but it's kind of a mixed bag. So um, we're gonna approve our budget at our next meeting and the, the board is making sure that we've got good measures in place to make sure that we have a conservative budget and we're ready for 
what may come. But the district has done a good job of keeping our financial sheet really clean over the last few years, and I think we're in a good position to handle whatever the up or down might be um, in the next nine, 12 months. Thank you. Is your ups and downs, is that cyclical, or is it just um, weather, or? Well, certainly it's seasonal. Seasonal. We, we definitely have months where our, um, those revenues are lower in the colder months. And uh, to some extent, it, it is based on the larger economy. Uh, our theory at one time was that because more and more things were going to be recycled, that our, that our income would be increasing over time. But um, that hasn't really proven to be the case. Um, you know, people are still purchasing and, and using all kinds of products. Um, and doing all kinds of shopping. I think maybe COVID-19 might, might change our pattern right now. So that's the sort of um, an unanticipated um, uh, alteration that I think we will be, we'll also be seeing. At the end of the briefing here, it says that the preliminary budget is set at 1.2 million. Is that up or down from last year? Um, that's down from last year, and actually, since um, preparing this and um, working on the budget with one of our committees, we've actually reduced our budget since that. But we're really, we're really um, doing everything we can to, to have a budget that is sustainable mm -hmm. this coming year. On the other hand, we also get grants often from national sources to do work on recycling and composting and community relations. Our district, we should be really proud. We, we're a leader in a lot of these issues, and we don't do it because we want to be a leader. We do it because it's the right thing to do and because the communities want it. And so we get recognized for that, and so we apply for grants to do more, and we've been very successful in getting grants. So the budget, so to answer your question, John, I mean, can go up and down because we got a $200,000 grant from the federal government to do an outreach project that has one and a half staff or something like that. So we have a short, and we have a year where we have a bump because of that, and then when the grant is up, everyone understands it's only for the grant. When it goes away, it goes away. Mm -hmm. And so that, so the budget has some ups and downs because of our funding stream partially coming from some of these pretty large grants that we've gotten over the last few years. But overall, the budget is, is held very, very much in check. And again, it's, it's getting smaller um, in the core budget uh, at this time. Okay. Any other questions for Kathleen or Matt? Thank you. 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 Okay, uh, Josh Walker, Black Road, Dana? Yeah, uh, I think, oh, there's Josh. Yeah, come on up here, Josh. Hi, Josh. This side, please. Hi. Yeah. So, um, I don't know if you got the email with the um, information I had from the fire department and the uh, state fire code about uh, with my need for access to my property for my home and my uh, rental property that I have at uh, on, uh, Black Road. I was um, looking to uh, up my maintenance agreement that the town put me at 16 feet and the fire department uh, requires a two vehicle width down through and the state fire code is uh, 20 feet clear. And I actually called Keith today. Okay. And because I was revealing this letter did, and you all, I hope you all got that letter. Did you all get the letter and the stuff from the fire, uh, state fire code? Yep. Yep. Uh, the stuff that I uh, dropped for Dana. That's it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I called Keith uh, and asked him what this letter actually meant because it left some uh, clear width of 20 feet. He said the trucks are a minimum of uh, seven and a half feet wide. So that to get them by, um, what he has up there now is, would be 
What, what I have up there now is uh, 12 feet of gravel surface and um, two feet on each side for snow banks and for maintenance. So the 20 feet would need to be kept clear. So I was um, looking to get a minimum of 25 feet so I'd have a maintenance area and place for snow. Where where are we at? Yeah, I think I know where we're at with our road policies as well. well. What's, what's the town's right of way through there? It's 39 feet. 39. 39. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's a town right of way in there. We did winter maintenance on it this year. Um, no, yeah, I didn't know because some old road, roads aren't necessarily three rods, so I wasn't sure. Yeah, that one is. And, um, and I want to thank you for the uh, road maintenance this year. It worked out fine for me. Um, I was hoping that it would uh, continue. I don't know what I would, what I need to do to have that continue. If uh, that falls into the uh, reclassification of the road to a class three, or or what that entails, another year of trial, or or what the board thinks we should do about that. It was nice not having anybody stuck in my in the access on the town road to get to my property this winter. Never happened one time this year, so that was great. Uh, I can't say the same for the last month or so when uh, people have been parking and not and me not being able to get into my uh, driveway. Who's been parking there? I did see that picture. Who, um, who was parking there? I'm was not sure. There was a, a car there. I don't know if um, it was a friend of the, uh, my neighbors. Okay. Or who it was. Um, I know I my neighbors had their house up for sale. If it was someone looking at the property, yeah. and they just put their car in park and left it there. Okay. Um, it's also happened just a few days ago, where there was um, they have a uh, they have a uh, lawn crew, which thought that they would leave their vehicle right in the middle of that road, and where I couldn't get through either. And uh, then when I went and I, I went around the vehicle, staying in the town right of way, and a little while later the Berlin Police Department shows up in my house, saying I was doing malicious behavior, or the the neighbors reported me saying I was doing malicious behavior when I went around the vehicle that was parked, and nobody around, trailer there, gate down, and I have pictures in my phone if you need to see them, but I hope you believe me. And that was one of uh, three times that actually it's happened this spring where there's been a vehicle left unattended so I couldn't get through. Somebody probably walking the black road. What's that? Somebody yeah. probably uh -huh. walking the black road. Dana, do we have an estimate on what it cost to widen the road? To bring it up to 49 feet? I don't have that, no. no we, I'm not we, looking we, to bring we, it up to we, 49 we had, feet. We had had Tim in here before, and he said it really wouldn't cost anything. That the road's grandfathered, the base is there. It was, it's a, it's it an existing, existing it's an existing, existing road. And and I had originally, I've lived there for 22 years. I originally had uh, agreement for maintaining the whole road to access my property, and a few years ago, um, I had some trouble with my neighbors, and they came and complained, and the town dropped me down to 12 feet. I don't have a reason, and I never got a reason. I didn't know if there were trees growing up on one there side. There's actually a, a big line of maple trees growing down one side, but those are barely still in the right of way. Most of the right of way, when you're going down, is on the right hand side, and the existing road base is there, other than after the town stopped me or you know stopped me from maintaining and just left me with 12 feet. It all got seeded and topsoiled and made into lawn. Tell me, tell me, Ben, and what do you do? What do you remember about these conversations with the expense to as far as? Well, I know Josh. When you first came, you were maintaining the road. You fixed it up for your own access. I did, and that's the agreement I had when I originally got the permit from the town to do it. I was gonna bring it up and I was going to maintain it yep. right through. And then when it got listed on a GPS for people 
getting directions to Northfield or wherever, it started sending traffic down that road. And yeah. so then's when the issue came up, that um, people were getting stuck, couldn't get out of there. So that's when I that was, that, that's when, you know, took a while, but the town ended up starting to maintain it, so that would cease. But we always started maintaining it here, what, last year? Last, last year was the first year that you yeah. maintained it, yeah. That was just for the winter? Just for the winter. So if this were to be widened out to, what were you looking for, 25 feet? 25 feet, yeah. So 20 feet. Probably 20 feet, 20 feet of um, surface, what the fire department recommends in the state fire code is yeah. would be 20 feet of surface gravel surface and then a couple feet each side for snow banks yeah. and for drainage you know for so that the water doesn't have to be directed right down the road I mean my concern with this is just the fact that we it seems like the in general the zoning if we're going to allow somebody to have a permit for a second residence or to add an additional dwelling unit, I feel as though these things should be taken into consideration prior as well. And so this should have been almost something we discussed before mm -hmm. the approval of that permit uh, because it's a and that's a recommendation that, from the fire department. That's something that had come up in the past meetings and it was going to wait until you get a permit or then wait until you get a signed lease and then wait until it was this and wait until that so now there's somebody living there so it's time to take care of it <clears throat> and i don't see the town having to have a big expense to do it i would um gladly help do what it takes to get that you know, I, I, that's what my agreement was with the town originally. Well, I would, I mean, for me, uh, this is one way or the other. Either you main, you move out to 20 feet and you maintain it, or the town maintains it to the 20 feet. Um, what I see here is a liability issue. Um, if, if it's a, corporate, a cooperative effort between you and the town, then I can see bad things happening. Okay. You know, it, it just yep. the way it is. It's nothing against you, Judge, just the way it is. Yeah. Um, so other than that, um, to, to, uh, to decide who would be maintaining the road, and if you want to stay with the old agreement, that would be you mm -hmm. to maintain the road. Well, the, the thing is with uh, the old agreement and me maintaining the road, now that... Um, there's a dead end road sign right at the end of it. Now that it's um, on a GPS, which wasn't in something that was around back 22 oh, yeah, years ago. And, and, and I'm telling you, it's every day now. It's every day now that someone I'm seeing someone come down and turn around down there. A minimum of one. And, and I don't know if that could be because of the neighbors have their property for sale right now. And it's attracting more people to come down. I, I don't know what it is, but definitely a lot of traffic coming down there and, and you know and it could be because of the walking around the pond I see a lot of people walking up and down that road now yeah biking you know if it is a class 4 road yeah. you're not and seeing any people parking down there to walk they aren't parking down there to walk yeah. nope when they see the shotgun come out on my porch I see the no I'm just kidding <laughs> Well, what's the pleasure of the board? I would like to see it. I mean, I think that's why we have this policy in place. I just want to make sure we have the procedure down to do it. Um, so I don't think that you know, we've been looking at building out a policy for the class four roads in the area, even upgrade, downgrade, class three, class four. Um, I think this is a topic that, I mean, there's a lot of little class four roads around here that have potential for huge development. Um, and if somebody was going to put a development on one of these back roads, um, that we can use the grandfathered ability to bring it up to class three and the proper widths, 
um, at minimal expense. I think it's something we should absolutely consider. Uh, I don't think that we should have permitted, permitted it uh, I mean, without having accessibility on a town highway to get fire trucks in there for a rental property. So that's just my thought. Well, the thing here is, is, um, is first the agreement we had with Josh was that he was to uh, fix it up. Originally, was to fix it up and maintain it. Um, do we want to take and do do have Josh uh, do the work, or should we just have the town do it? It's a great question. Tim. I, it's a really good question because I was actually going to refer back to the 2017 when the topic, and that was before my time on the board, but the topic at that point in time was class four and ownership. So it was before my time when the ownership portion of it was discussed. And then I was looking at the documentation that we've had to review. And, you know, I, I think the ownership aspect as well as who's going to maintain it is really what it boils down to, in my mind. It's different property owners that um, own, so there would be three different abutters on that road that would be ownership of the three? road. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, technically, it's so that four would, parcels, right? Well, it's four parcels, but I own two of the parcels, so it, what it is, it comes down into a T. I have a property on the left and on the right. Okay. So. It, and then, and then the road continues, but it's unimproved. Tim, very unimproved. Tim would be able to answer your question as to what the expense would be to get that road to get uh, block road to a twenty foot width of uh, clear pass. Road width. Huh? Road width. Twenty foot wide. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's not going to take a whole lot. The only problem is we got a little bit of ledge in one place there, but other than that, it's just going to have to strip it back and. And the ledge is just in one spot. Well, yeah. that's the only place I've ever seen. Okay. It, it is at one spot, Tim, and I think that it uh, with an excavator with a uh, hammer on the end of it, you know, because I was thinking that. Oh well, we yeah, to rent one of them because we don't have one. Yeah, or I might be able to. I might be able to get one to have that, at least that part of the work done. Is that, that's the only problem of putting a ditch down through there so that it's, you got good drainage, is that ledge. Yep. And I had some of the trees cut last year. We, uh, hmm. I personally think the town should probably do the work if we are going to widen it. If there's um, different property owners there, and it sounds like there, there's some um, different perspectives on road width and driving around each other, and it, it would be, it, it may be a headache for one landowner to, to widen the road past another landowner's property. It may cause some issue. It would be more proper, in my view, if, if the town did that. Totally agree. Yeah. Any thoughts, Tim? No. What what you guys want? I mean, it's not it's not like it's two or three miles long either. Yeah. I mean, it's not very far. And the first part of it's pretty pretty good as a start. Like I said, one place is the ledge. Yeah, and I think there'd be like maybe one tree maybe that we need to come down on the same side right by that ledge. Yeah. Ledge is on the left as you're going down through. On the right, right going down through. Right. right going down. Right on the end of the lawn. Yeah. Right where it goes back into the, little, the kind of wooded area, brush and right where the stone wall is over there, right? Pump yeah. and repile and lawn. Yeah. Uh, maybe while Tim's here, 
um, uh, what should we do about maybe getting another year of winter maintenance or is this going to change if this approves this would automatically change that that the town is uh, taking that section of road back over and I won't have to get approval for winter maintenance again for this coming winter I think what we need to do with that is look at our class four to three road policy because I really don't well, think we got issue here finalized too yeah I don't think we should be talking, talking about that right now right. well okay. I, yeah, I think they're I, separate yeah okay, um, okay. And I think winter, winter I thought that Tim was here might be a good opportunity to sure I think every year wants to apply stuff um I would make a motion that we widen the road to 20 feet I'll second that motion any further discussion so um with a 20 feet um, that um, gives me a 20 foot width and then if anything a comp, uh, arises that I would call the town for maintenance along the edge of the road about drainage you know about walk the way the water runs down the road and so I think what your motion was was 20 feet of clear, well, of clear the road and then and a couple town, feet town each side for her to put uh, in town, snow and the town would maintain the yeah, I'm talking about you know following this back here to make sure two got two cars can get by each other. Yep. Yeah. Safely. My second still stands. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. Um. Any date? Any kind of idea when this may happen? We'll have to leave it up to Tim because he's got to do the work. Right? Before he gets done, or? <laughs> no, I, it's not I, I don't think it can happen before I get done. Yeah. Because I got other projects going that I'd like to see get done. Well, let's just leave it before before uh, October. When does construction season stop? And not October, here? No, normally. Yeah. yeah. Normally. Yeah. And the ground freeze is really it's pretty much weather related. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's weather related. Mm -hmm. so if you're talking about paving or not. Well, not paving, but probably. Well, that'll be the next meeting. <laughs> yeah. I'll probably have to take and see about uh, <laughs> if. Um, we'll have to take and see if. Uh, <coughs> move it back to probably November 1st. Mm -hmm. Have it done before November 1st if possible. Mm -hmm. Okay, anything else? I think that's good. Oh, one other thing, if I can go back and just bother about um, <laughs> the, um, this is on a whole different uh, subject, was the snowmobile trail, again, back down um, Black Road and on Brookfield Road. Remember last year we came and wanted, we tried to get approval and the town approved us all the way up to Black Road, up to my property, and we were wondering, we're still trying to get it to go up over um, Darling Road up over the mountain over to Northfield and the uh, Conservation Committee um, needs the bridge redone up there and I have talked with Bass and as a matter of fact they had called me back today and said that they would donate the uh, steel beams that they need to, to go across that stream there um, and they were really hoping that maybe you would reconsider letting the snowmobile trail go down this section of uh, Black Road, which we were going to really try to get off the road and onto the side where the logging has been. It's all cleared down through, and I don't know where the right-of-way of the town is there, and if we can stay in the town right-of-way, but off the road. And then um, just go for that little short section of Brookfield Road. It's just uh, something to chew on maybe for a while. I know it wasn't something on the agenda, but uh, since the guy called me today, I said I was going to be at a meeting tonight, and then I would bring up that, um, that the uh, Snowmobile Club would do a lot of the work to have that bridge redone. Josh, the section of uh, Brookfield Road that you're talking about is to the trailhead to Black Road? To the trailhead to Black Road, yeah. And if there's any other way we can get around there, I've been trying and trying with the landowners, and it's uh, been uh, quite an issue with the city of Montpelier because the city of Montpelier owns both sides for a ways there, and they really uh, pretty much slammed the door in my face about getting onto their property. Would would they be willing to come to maybe one of the next meeting or the meeting after? I can try. I what I'll do is I'll go and speak with the. Uh, 
the uh, city administrator, whoever it would be that I need to talk to for the city of Montpelier. Is well, that I'm talking about the people from that. Oh, they would absolutely would. Yep. But they don't want to, I mean, they, they were even saying, you know, whether or not we can get the trial, we just as soon help the conservation committee. We'll donate well, the beams. I was there when they, they said yeah, they would help. They, they said that they would help and uh, get the beams as long as, like, someone else would pay for the trucking to get them up there. But they would donate the beams and then through the other, you know, committees, the, uh, you know, through VAST, the local snowmobile clubs, the conservation committee, I'm sure we could come up with a few thousand dollars to deck it. And do and you know build the bridge, and there, there's plenty of volunteers out that would do do it all the labor for free. When we when we went up, and just I know we're getting off a little bit, but when we went up and put the decking on temporarily on that, we uh, Phil was there and Tom and uh, Josh. Oh, when we first went to look at it, and the gentleman from Bass, um, and he brought up a good point, actually, regardless of whether or not snowmobile traffic can go through there with that trailhead and all, it'd be a pretty good idea to be able to get a tractor through if you needed to do any repairs or anything up yeah. there. Right, get a little mini excavator up there to do the yeah. water bars. Water bars and, yeah, yeah. and the brush hogs to do that. Because I know they've tried to brush hog the fields and they have a hard time getting a... Jim Chandler has brought his up through the woods and back ways and you know to just get up there to try to brush off some of this stuff and he's getting kind of old and I don't know if he's going to be able to continue doing that. Well let's see if we can get it on the agenda for one of the upcoming meetings and have them be here as well and maybe the conservation committee at the same time would be good to invite. I agree. Mm -hmm. I want to thank you for helping with the uh, fix the bridge at least temporarily. To oh, no trouble. So it's been, I've been up there going up there for years, and I like to see that stay open. I like having the access myself. Yeah, yeah. do what we got to do. Okay, okay, I think I'm done. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. Thanks, Tim. Yep. yep. Um, schedule that for sometime in July. Okay. Mm -hmm. That gives enough notice for landowners and the residents that yep. they want to attend. Okay, discussion of the road grader. Did the did Caterpillar say why they thought there was a spike in copper? It's not Caterpillar. It's an oil company. Yeah. And did they give you any idea why it would be just just copper? That's what killed me was you would think it was. No, he said that a lot of your rings are copper now. Well, a lot, of your, a lot of those are banjo fittings, and they use copper compression rings to hold the pressure. But I was wondering if, it, I mean, the only thing that was high was copper. Everything else was well within spec. And I was thinking maybe even the oil cooler, if that was a copper oil cooler. Just chewing uh, it out. He just, he just called me that, that um, a lot of it, they feel, is stressed on the, on the cylinders. So I don't know if he's talking about barons and sleeves and but the only thing I'm I'm confused about is that copper was way out of way out of whack. The rest of the oil was fine, relatively speaking. So I was just wondering why it would uh, give such a high reading in copper. And I don't know much about it, but I just I did read with copper and like heavy equipment and that and it said sometimes it was just natural wear in the cooler. Yeah. Um, and all that, but I don't know what that level means. Or, you know, I mean, uh -huh. you see, like bearings, the bearings and everything. You have copper, tin. Uh, there's a lot of different metals in a bearing. You know, they're basically a glorified Babbitt bearings, all they are. And uh, you'd have a lot of different metals that be, should be high too. But all you have is copper. I, I guess you'd have to talk to a mechanic that works on yeah. Well, I've never torn one apart. Yeah. So you sent the oil sample in, got it tested. Mm -hmm. that, and that's their feedback there. Mm -hmm. that you didn't speak to the mechanic. No. Okay. Well, I have to talk to a mechanic. No one would South work. He's a mechanic for the city of Barry now, but he used to work at Hill Martin for years. And he, he said that those engines, when they get up around between 55 and 7,000 hours, you're going to start having trouble with bearings in them. 
and they end up rebuilding the motor. He said that's that's just common in all of them, not just cat. Because Northfield's greater must have been about, I think when I was there, when I left there, it was about 5,500 or 6,000 hours on it. And shortly after I left, about a year later, they had to put a new motor in it. How much would it cost to proactively rebuild the motor? Um, I don't know. You know, but before it, before something major happens, do it have it? You know, have a fresh rebuild of. The only thing is, is that you've got other problems with it, too. And we've already, I've already got a, an estimate from Caterpillar there, and that was over fifty thousand dollars. For all the other things wrong with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That includes the Mold board's real bad. When I was telling Dana the other day when I was grading with it, you can see it. It just looks like it just goes like this all the time. And then people wonder why your roads are choppy. It's it's just it's just I mean there's shims and everything else in there and we've we've been really good about putting new ones in and keeping it shimmed up, but it's got a lot of I mean it's got a, it works hard and it's in the dirt all the time. It's hard later. And you, we've had one front wheel replaced already, the, the vital planetary thing in the front wheel, and that was almost five thousand dollars. And the other one's getting really noisy. When I ran it today, creating air heart hill, it was doing quite a bit of howling. When we purchased that one, we purchased it used. Uh -huh. Correct. Yeah, I think it was a rental. Uh, I, right. Gary Markham told me that he thought it was a rental, so I don't know. You didn't have that many hours on it, didn't 63. Yeah. Hundred. So it was well, 63 hours on it, wasn't it? Oh, no, 63. I don't know how many hours on it when they got it. Wouldn't that be? Probably like a rental car, though. And that's right. that's why I figured it probably was a rental, because it didn't have a whole lot of hours. It had More like a demo. How much is the new grader? Well, he gave us a rough, rough estimate. It was three hundred and something thousand. And what was the trade-in on this one? All kept, uh, he, he just gave me a budget thing. Yeah. You know, he didn't get right down to give a total what he'd give us for it, but it was sixty-five thousand trade. But you're not going to get that from Caterpillar. Because no. they know what's wrong with it. Do we owe anything left on it? Do we owe anything on it? Yeah. No, we don't. Well, we've had that, it's been paid off a couple of years now. So we've got. I think it's been paid up for five years. Well, it, it was in that group that we had all the time. Yeah. That, I mean, I'm leaving, but it's it's that mean. Tim, the fifty thousand dollars that he told you, huh? He the guy gave you a figure of fifty thousand dollars. It was a little over. It was over fifty thousand. And what was his is? You know, do I understand right when he said? What would fifty thousand dollars do? What are, um, well, that was new tires, which was ten grand. So there's ten off it. Mm -hmm. um, rebuild the mold board. Pull the transmission because there's no parking brake. And right now the parking brake's flashing all the time, but it hasn't come on. But I don't know what's going to happen. It, you shut it off sometimes and it'll it'll go away and don't come back on but the next time you put it back in gear. Um, to fix the front wheels, um, fix the articulating pistons and and um, bearings and, and stuff. And he said that he asked me if we'd had any trouble with the, the planetaries and the rear ends. Which we haven't. I mean, I mean we have had none, nothing there, but who's to say? Yeah. 
I mean, I, I only told him what I knew was wrong with it. So when they pulled the oil sample, they just did it for the motor, they didn't do it for the transmission? No. Well, the, 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 the reason the transmission's got to come out because the parking brake's inside of it. Yeah. And he said the only way they can fix it is to pull the transmission. You have to take it right down out to fix it. So after they do all that, there's no warranty on the still have issues, right? Probably six months. If that, mm -hmm. 60 days maybe. They aren't too generous with their warranties. And I, I didn't get a price from Cat when when Dana asked me to get a price so that we could have a ballpark figure for budget. Um, John Deere salesman stopped a couple days after him and I talked, so I had him look at it and everything, and then he got back to me with the what, what they give us and what a new one is. But he's new, the salesman's new, and I don't think that he probably really knows because Mr. Pally gets a wicked discount. And the, and the service guy at CAT told me that too. He said, you know, you, so it could be even cheaper than what he told us for a price. What's, uh, what's the savings and the equipment for? Well, we put 250000 in for FY21, but, you know, we hadn't exactly said where we are going to put it, but it's not like I've got the cash to, yeah. to pay for that, even in July. Um, we're going to have to have at least one payment come in from the taxpayers for me to have that kind of cash. You mean to pay for it right, cash? to pay with cash, correct. Right now, we've got $80,000 worth of payments on other equipment. If we end up borrowing money for that one, we're going to be way over 100000 per, per year on equipment. What would that do to us if you paid the entire thing in cash as far as the fall? I mean... Yeah, I'd have to find, you know, you have to have the money bought, obviously. Yeah. I'm not going to have that for a while. So and what I'm hearing you say is that we wouldn't have the money to buy a new grader anyways until after September. I would agree. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And depending on how we collect money with this COVID thing, too. You know, right. That's another big, big issue. That's the big if for me. But you're correct. Because what happens with the first payment that we have normally in the past is a lot of people pay for the entire year. So I have you know, usually a good amount of cash by September. But I don't dare say I'm going to have that because I don't know. Right. And the trouble is if they pay, I mean, we're appreciated to get it all at once, but they're not going to be playing, paying it in the installments on the go forward yeah so so it kind of sounds like just based on what tim told us last last week or two weeks ago when we were here we need those tires now right i mean those tires aren't going to last us this, the summer well so the belts I mean, are showing i have a spare over there so that's better shape than what's on the front of it right now but that's only one i mean we might be able to make it through the only thing is the front ones are, are just moving this floor and just steel cords showing in one of them. And how are the rear? Rears, rears aren't as bad. Can we get away with The, the front end of it does right more digging than the back end because the back's so much heavier. And you can't, you can't grade these roads, not in this town anyways, in, in two wheel or just the rear wheels. You just can't do it. They're so hard. Mm -hmm. What two new, what just doing the front tires right now makes sense if we're considering other options? Oh, we could do just two front tires, yeah. And, I mean, like I said, I got a spare over there that's way better than the ones that are on it right now. Because they, they, they had a brand new spare there. And when I bought tires last time, I only bought five. And I put that new spare on, so save us buying another tire. And then I saved one of the metal ones as a spare. Diane, would we have $50,000 or $60,000 that we could... Yeah, if potentially, I mean, right now I'm, I'm doing okay with cash. Um, 
I know what I need to have to get me through July, and I probably, you know, I would like to think I would have that available. Mm -hmm. What What about? I know the truck dealerships are doing it, and I think the equipment dealers are doing the same thing: is is leasing it for a year, and then at the end of the, the year you purchase it. Well, I think probably the first thing to do is get a firm price. You know. Well, I can check into what a lease is. Yeah. I mean, a lot of towns just lease them. They don't. They don't purchase. They just. They just lease them. And Five years with warranties up. They swap them. Is this a lease that at the end of the term you buy it for a certain amount or? Yeah, I think the lease, the lease for the, the first year goes towards the purchase and then after that year if you want to buy it or just let it go back. Mm -hmm. Could we try it out? We are in a financial situation. There's only, quite there's tight. only, there's only two, two graders now. Volvo is no longer making a grader. They had so much trouble with theirs, they, they stopped building them. Yeah, and there's just Cat and John Deere. There's Case too, but Case is, they're just, they're not that big of a machine. The So the, you'd only have the two to take it and uh, give you estimates, and that's cat and job deer? Yep. Yep. And I mean, there's quite a few. Roxbury just got a new John Deere, and Williamstown just got a new cat last year. So there's... there's some around here that I could go look at after. You know, Roxbury likes their John Deere, and I guess Cat uh, Williamstown likes their Cat. So. Well, I still think probably the first thing to do is just get a firm price. We know what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. So we can see if we can budget for it. Do you want me to ask him about? The lease part. I mean, the lease is going to go towards the purchase. Towards the purchase, if you purchase it. Would that be any different than if we borrowed the money and had a down payment? You'd have to pay. Well, did we buy a truck where we didn't make the payment till after we got the truck that we took and bought? It. We paid for it later on. We bought trucks where uh, the, the first payment would, would come due a year later. We've done that yeah. a few right. times. Right, that's right. Yeah. yeah, we've done that quite a few times. Mm -hmm. So potentially, I mean, if we could work something like that, however, it's you're gonna, it's going, you're gonna feel it in the next budget year. Right. Well, right. you know, if you are gonna convert it at some point, then you are going to be obligated to pay for it. Okay. Right. I like guess I'm lease, just trying to say the whole amount of your lease towards the is 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 a lease really obviously they lease to make money and yeah. I got it but you know um, are we in the same situation if we're paying the lease or if we're paying the down payment I don't know I'm just you know not all of the leases go towards the down payment obviously no yeah. no I mentioned the how much of the cost of the grader did we borrow last time? Um, that was before my time, but I think what they did is they borrowed, I think, all of it at that point in time, and then they rolled it over into another loan later. How many they bought three pieces of equipment and one loan. I think they took about five years to pay it off anyways. Mm -hmm. What year is that grader? 2007. Yeah. So. So it's been a good grader. It's lasted. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean we've had a, we've had to spend a little money in the last couple of years. Yeah. And it sounds like it's mm -hmm. been paid off for a while, so that's good also. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe what you need to start with, like you said, is to get a firm price so you know what you're talking about. 
and firm price and probably uh, uh, probably the, the uh, financing options too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And for comparison. Mm -hmm. um, is there any merit to following up any further with this estimated fifty thousand dollar repair? And I know well, I realize it's nothing's guaranteed the, in that, but the oil people they said to take and run it for a service and then retest. Yes. Yeah. I just serviced it. Though. Well, how often do you service it? Every three hundred hours. Uh huh. How often do you service every three hundred hours? Two hundred and fifty. Was that two hundred and fifty? Two fifty. That's six weeks. Six, seven it's weeks. Got, I think a hundred hours on it since they serviced it. We have eighty thousand dollars a year in loans for highway equipment. Is that right? Right now. Well, ten thousand of it has to do with this building. Okay, I'm sorry. Bond, All right, seventy thousand. So if we paid, say, with two hundred and fifty thousand dollars for the last one, it took us five years to pay off, so we're paying fifty thousand dollars a year. Mm -hmm. if we fix it. We can get a couple of years out of it. But it's a little bit of a gamble. But not knowing, I mean, we're we're. If, you know, if this was last year, it seems like we'd say, you know, let's let's do it. You know, let's let's buy a new one. But I think there's a bunch of, uh, you know, unpredictable things going on that are, are a little scary financially for everyone, right? And well, as you know, so many of our costs are fixed. Well, they're and, not though, right? And, like, well, if you if you borrow money, money, they are. Right. You told me they were all fixed, and when I look, they're not necessarily fixed. I'm talking about loans. Yeah. yeah. So but, just, but many costs are fixed, and I, I hear well, what you're saying. Think, I'm not arguing with you. Yeah. Um, but um, we've got seventy thousand dollars in loan obligation now. I'm uneasy about having it at one hundred twenty thousand. I'd be really uneasy about having three hundred and seventy thousand then. Well, I would do. And we need this piece of equipment. It's very important. I agree. You know, I agree with him. You know, it's, uh, so what, if this one breaks down, what happens? Does you lease one? You'd have to. Well, well, you'd have to rent one, one, I guess. Rent one. Yeah, how accessible are those? So if we do, no, the last time we had troubles, we rent uh, uh, new boys, didn't we? They don't even have them no more. They sold theirs. Yeah. Theirs. yeah. They, they, Jeff Newton talked when he heard that we were talking. I don't know if he saw it from the Fletman's meeting or what, but about buying hours. He said that he'd like to, they'd be interesting in buying hours. Oh, great, 200,000. Well, I think, I think, I think, I think this kind of reinforces my point a little bit, you know, in, in, you know private business versus town is, Private business is going to put another six or seven thousand hours on that thing, put a little bit of money into it, but they're not going out and buying a brand new one right now, given the uncertainty in the in you know just yeah, the they don't, right now. They don't use it though. I ran Dubois's grader for the last two years in the summertime for them. I did parking lots and driveways and roads and stuff on weekends and our days off on Fridays. And, and they had somebody that really wanted it in New Hampshire, so they sold it. And they hadn't replaced it yet. But, I mean, I didn't, I was the only one that used it. Can, I haven't, I don't remember seeing the repair, the repair estimate for the 50000 Was that before? I haven't seen it either. Tim got that. Uh, did, you, did they email you that or anything? Um, I thought I gave it to you, Dana. No, you told me that it was fifty thousand dollars. That call, might be something we should Matt. have him. I'll call him. We should do it because I think he said he was going to email it to me, but I don't. Maybe I don't. he didn't. That's I guess what you said to me. Okay. Yeah, I want to take a look at that for sure. Well, I take and have the uh, the testing company retest the oil, change the oil, and then retest it. Run well. It. You run it, run, run it till for another 100 hours, 150 hours, and then take and have them retest it. 
I mean, just I seemed, that was their recommendation, wasn't it? Yeah, it just seems odd to me that it was just copper. Mm -hmm. You know, because bearing material is so many metals. True. Well, it does suggest in there to redo it. Yeah. Right. So. But it doesn't also, it also doesn't hurt to take a look at what, what it, get a firm price on a new one, too. It, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we know what we're talking about. Right. Yeah. yeah so and what it would entail. Some very specific information. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Because if the oil, if the oil comes back and it's, it is bad, and if the motor is showing signs of wear, then it'd be nice to be able to have that option to get, you know, see what it's going to cost to keep a new one. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Because no matter what happens, if the grader breaks down, the roads go to hell. <laughs> I don't want to be the one taking the phone call. <laughs> no. but, but I mean, this ha this happens in towns, right? I mean, graders break down. Yeah. Equipment uh, breaks down. And, yeah. I'm not saying that you know we want that to happen or we should <laughs> allow it to happen, but I'd be interested in you know what what it would cost to rebuild the motor. Is it you know a ten thousand dollar job or a twenty thousand well, dollar job? A lot, yeah. a lot of that depends on what if you have what they do an in chassis or if you have it taken out and. Remand. Mm -hmm. well, they've, done, they've done the top part of it. Got all new injectors and new injector pump. That cost us, well, I don't know what it was, $8,000. When was that done, Tim? Um, Last year, wasn't it? No. No. Wasn't that long ago? No. Two years ago. Two years? Yeah. Because if you have an in chassis done, Basically, what they're doing is they're they're uh, changing your uh, rods, main bearings, and popping the uh, pistons out, changing them, and your uh, cylinder sleeves, and doing the head work, the valves, and whatnot. And then you have it remanned completely. Then they t pull it out and they test that all the metal works for fatigue and everything else. Mm -hmm. But you need Truck motors, they'll take and remit, they'll do an in chassis on those things three or four times. They pull them out to be completely done. Right. But I would say, if, I mean, from my point of view, it would be just take and have the uh, go another to the recommendations on the oil testing company and then take and uh, just get a price on a new grader and so we have an idea of what we're looking at. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if you need a vote on that or if you just want to have, to have the uh, Tim get the numbers. I, I don't think you need a vote right now. I think we can just go forward. We're not going to take it and be doing any, any you know. big expenditure. You might be annoyed if we had a new grader in the garage next yeah. week. But. <laughs> well, <laughs> okay, anything else on this, Tim? Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Tim. Uh, signatures of approved all hazard mitigation plan. Yes, you approved the all hazards plan, and I think it was the May 18th meeting. Okay. And I did not have you sign the signature card, the okay. signature. So, if you would do that for me. Did we move the um, warrants? And payroll to a different part of the agenda? Uh, no, it's just, it's just you haven't done it. Yeah. It's. So I'll change the oil this week. Uh, when did you, the recommendation was just run it to the for the for the usual time, right? It so, says yeah. uh, change oil and filters, if not already done, resample at the normal inter interval. So another 130 hours or 150 hours. Yeah. I believe I have a little filter over there. I'm using the one for the normal. Using one I put on like that. On the Oh, you don't know. I have to spare. have to do it. So I'll, I'll get it changed. Is there, so can, is there any way you want it? Is there any way they test, they test transmission fluid too? Um, I 
Thank you. I don't. I don't think there's anything wrong with the transmission. Right. Oh, is this? Yeah, yeah. that's in the transmission, and then it's not. Okay. The gearbox is getting a little sloppy. It just kind of, the demo just kind of flops around. You don't know what gear you're in. And the dash thing, that, that the digital dash thing that tells you what gear you're in, the, the lights are all burned out. So you just go by the number of clicks, you go in the gear. Yeah. <laughs> what gear you're in. <laughs> I've had cars like that. Okay, so let's see here. Um, the CV Fiber? Yes. Um, CV Fiber has asked for a letter of support and they gave a sample, which I'm going to find very shortly. Um, Flo had suggested a revision on the last sentence, which I went ahead and did. All right, hold on, let me get myself organized here. There we go, sorry. Um, so, um, you've all read the, the letter, and, and basically what was the change was at the end, uh, the last sentence says, and this was Flo's suggestion, this grant is essential to enable CV, CV Fiber to advance their concerted efforts to fill the evident need for high-speed broadband to our entire community. And uh, they are asking for the board to send this letter. Dana, for the people on TV, can you tell us who the, who the recommendation is going to? It's going to the... Um, CV Fiber is applying for a grant. This is CV Fiber is the um, entity that is working on bringing internet throughout Berlin and the area, the central Vermont area that are unserved by broadband. And it's going to the office of the federal co-chair, Northern Border Regional Commission in Concord, New Hampshire with a copy to the Deputy Secretary at the Agency of Commerce and Community Development. And the letter, if it helps, I'll read the letter. Bear with me. This is a letter of support for CB Fiber's grant application for their Northern Border Regional Commission, application for an economic and infrastructure development investment program grant for the construction of a pilot high-speed internet project of their phase one efforts as referenced in their recently completed feasibility study. The town of Berlin is a member of the CB Fiber Communications Union District. We are in urgent need of high-speed broadband for the future vitality of our community. The current COVID-19 pandemic has greatly increased the urgency for this project the current services, if offered at all, are totally inadequate. The need is urgent. We have local businesses who need high-speed service to stay competitive. Many students and teachers are at a huge disadvantage trying to stay up with classwork. It is essential to support telehealth. The new norm is high-speed internet at every premises. The project would increase the accessibility of high-speed internet which we contend is necessary for all Vermonters, including rural areas. We wholeheartedly support their application for the Economic and Infrastructure Development Investment Program to construct their Phase 1 pilot project. The grant is essential to enable CB Fiber to advance their concerted efforts to fill the evident need for high-speed broadband to our entire community. Very truly yours, Select Board of Berlin. So, so who would be signing it, uh, Brad? I've got it, so since you're all here, I thought it would be a nice thing if you all signed it. If you agree to do that. Why would we? I make the motion that we approve the CV Fiber letter of support, and each of us to sign it. Okay. You a second? Oh, I'm just curious. I mean, I don't have, I'm not opposed to it necessarily, but I just want to know what is the phase one and will it be completed if they get this grant or you know what can we expect as a result out of it? 
Um, this was, I guess it was the liaison, the, our liaison, our representative, as you know, is Jeremy Hansen to CB Fiber, okay. and the alternate is Jerry uh, Diamatidis. Mm -hmm. And Jerry is on this committee working on the, um, um, this grant aspect of it. So, I, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I, I think that the, the end result is to um, get broadband service in Berlin. Right. I was how now, far phase one, I can't tell you the phases. No, I do not know. I was just saying, yeah. will it be completed yeah. or will yeah. I know? I'm just curious. I, I, this, yeah, I, I think in order to do it properly, we need a second to kind of keep discussing. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> it, it's okay. That would be, we hear a second? Yeah. I'll second. Okay. So, any further discussion? Yeah. First? Sorry. We, did you make the motion? So, so I, I'll, I'll just say that, um, you know, I think there's 17 towns maybe that have yeah. joined this consortium, so to speak, or this uh, uh, CUD, they call it, which is a, a union district, a communication union district. And so it doesn't necessarily, Berlin's going to go first or in phase one. Um, it, we could be three years from now, potentially. Um, they look at the towns with the most need, um, the towns that are most excited about build up, the towns that have the most people and square mile where they can serve and start to build revenue back to fund other projects. It's a lot like the e EV fiber mm -hmm. um, down in, I call it Southern Vermont, but it's mm -hmm. really Central Southern. Um, and it, it's, been a, it's been a pretty good, um, project down there, a pretty good business model. They've brought fiber to a lot of homes, really uh, added service to an area that just completely lacked service. So I think it has a lot of uh, merit to the project. It doesn't cost the uh, Berlin taxpayers anything from the Berlin tax rolls. Um, these grants are, you know, through uh, the Agency of Commerce and Community Development through the state budget and through federal grants. Um, me as a uh, member of the cabinet, I will be abstaining um, just so there's no appearance of any conflict, but it's something I certainly support. Even if Berlin doesn't go right away, it will serve uh, Vermonters um, the, that desperately do need it. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. One abstention. Okay, Dana. Uh, tapping in the town forest. Yes. Um, well, some time ago, Justin had given me, um, I guess, an email regarding Northfield taps sells taps for trees, um, lease taps for trees for, for the maple sugaring season. And coincidentally enough, this week I received a telephone call from uh, Joe Mangum, who happens to also be our vendor for the cemeteries, saying that he's the guy that rents the taps from Northfield and he would like to rent taps from us. Um, I told him I would have to talk to the board about it. Um, and the same day, I heard from uh, J.C. Earle from uh, the Conservation Commission, who um, was telling me that he believes that tapping trees harms them and takes away from their value. Um, this is obviously, maple syrup season isn't tomorrow, but it's something I think we need to talk about a little further, yeah. if you're going to give Mr. Magnum an answer. Well, um, when you do tap trees, uh, it uh, enlarges the heartwood, which the people who are buying logs for lumber are looking for the sapwood, which is the white wood. That's probably what he's telling me. Yeah. That, yeah. So there's yeah. I'm friends with an individual that is, uh, he works for with UBM. And so they'll have a different forestry division that's actually looking at it um, from from non lumber, 
and actually how to improve your forest uh, or how to improve your sugar woods to optimize for um, sap production. Um, so I, that's what sparked me. I thought it was, I thought, I think it's a revenue, possible revenue stream for the entire state. Um, and I know Northfield did it from when I was actually up on one of the trails one day. Um, I was, couldn't believe I saw the lines on Northfield Town Forest. Um, so I don't know who this gentleman is that approached you. We, we know, the, uh, well, I know the gentleman. Yeah. I mean, he's done, um, what, what I don't know, um, I haven't calculated what the revenue would be. Right. Um, and also, um, I would like to go up there and see where, where we're talking about. I'm, yeah. You know, just because. Absolutely. Um, um, and I think we should, uh, Wayne, or Wade rather, he would be a good, he works with UVM. He would probably be willing to have a discussion with the board about pros and cons of it as well. Yeah. well uh, I think you'd yeah. want to keep the Conservation Commission involved. Absolutely. Yeah. The only nice thing about tapping is you get income every year, whereas logging you get it every 15, right? And does it off? Does one offset the other? So who knows? You know what I mean? Though, no, if it devalues the wood to a certain extent, are you making that up with the revenue over here in the annual revenue? I don't know that much about. I think when, when are I, we going to log I, it? I actually, John, I think you would make it up sugaring if you were selling the sap. Right. Or selling the syrup. Yeah. Because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you got all your other additives into the uh, into the process. Right. So I think Northfield leases for a dollar or a dollar fifty a tap. I mean, taps. The idea. A lot. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. sizable. It's huge. Dana, could you get a copy of the Northfield contract? Yeah. So we could see what what they're getting and look through it. Mm -hmm. I would love that. Be a good, yes. good way for you to. I will ask for it. Yes. Almost. Thanks, Dana. You almost have to have a forester cruise the uh, cruise the area and get an estimate on the uh, number of taps it could take support. Yeah, or or UVM. Yeah. yeah, because different sized trees can hold more ta a different different number of taps. Yep. Yeah. Where is the town forest? Up on our shelf. It's, it's up next to the Northfield town forest. Right oh, okay. Right up top of the no, up near yeah. the tower. Yeah. So you actually leave Berlin and hit Northfield. Yeah. It's already right there, so he would it would obviously be advantageous for someone to pick up. Well, he's going to do is add on to his lines already. I believe that was his intent. So. Yes. So I think you would just want to make sure that it was. Well, I I know I, know I saw Bud Matheson, which he lives in Berlin, and he had tapped in the in this part of Berlin, I think, by accident. And he took them down. And I saw that on Northfield Selectman's meeting. How long ago was that? Oh, years ago. Oh, okay. Yeah, I think it's it's given the uncertainty of the time. You know, it's another thing. You know, everybody should look at additional ways to generate revenue. Maybe it's not just taxing things we already taxed. Well. Look into that, Dana. I will ask Northfield for their contract. Anything else on this? No, not okay. right now. Um, approval of licenses, permits, vouchers, and applications. I make the motion to approve general funds accounts payable warrant number 20G22 with checks 2229 to 2246 in the amount of $49,501.84. Payroll Warrant 20-24 for payroll from May 10th, 2020 to May 23rd, 2020, paid on May 27th, 2020 in the amount of $40,288.53. Second by motion. Any further discussion? Hearing none, those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. Uh, Approval of Berlin's uh, the select board minutes of 5-04-2020. Make the motion to approve the select board minutes from May 4th and May 18th, 2020. Doing them both at the same time? Okay. Do I hear a second? 
Yeah, I second it. Okay. Uh, any further discuss discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion carries. Is everybody here for these? Do we also need to approve the May 12th? I don't see that listed. Um, I didn't list it, but there is May 12th in there. I make um, the motion that we approve the special meeting Tuesday, May 12th, 2020, as well. Second. Any further discussion? If not, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. Administrator's Yes. Um, I've got a couple things I want to talk to you about, and one is what we were talking about a little earlier on this town road policy. Last time we talked about it, it was in a Zoom meeting, and quite frankly, it was very difficult for me to understand what was being said. Um, I got two things that the board had thought about at that time, and that was how many residents um, would generate the town taking over a road. Um, and we're trying to tie that in with the zoning code. Um, so I talked to Tom about it at, at length and said how many, what happens. And so as far as what the zoning code he says says is that after so many residents, it has to be brought up to the standards that the town, the town standards, and that way it would be ready if the town were to accept it. That's but it. that's not necessarily the case. Um, he cautioned about us putting a number in our policy because it would necessitate us to accept a road. Okay. Um, you know, and I could see that well, fear. Bringing it up to town standards is different than upgrade of an already existing class four road. I thought right. that you, was the policy. I think you're talking about going from private to public. Right. right? Like I am now, yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, so that was that was the answer on that. Um, so and did so he I have, did he have any input on public to public, like the number of dwelling units is a recommendation on a upgrade of an existing class four road? He did, he did not, because that is not in the zoning code. Mm. Um, right. So, um, you know. Have, I know we have you know, driveway standards. And so, like I that. mean, I think, I think we're, so what I'm saying to you is I think it's going to be this board that's going to decide if it, if it comes down to a number. Okay. And if it comes down to a number, we're obligated by the agreement that the town has to bring roads up to the state standards that we agreed to live by for our new roads. When, when the board accepted the state standards, which they had to to get the um, funding, um, but that didn't mean that all our roads had to be up to standards, and of course they're not. Um, but new ones do need to be from the go forward. Well, new roads, um, for the most part, the only new roads you're going to see is a development. Right. right. And that is covered here. That's, yeah. that's okay. So that's yeah. integrated yeah. in. Okay. The yeah. the problem comes with when Joe Schmo builds a house out in the pasture, and then his son builds one next to it. So I let him subdivide or let him. And slowly you start to get you develop a community out there, but there's no uh, private to public on the road on the access. Now we had one up on Vine Street. Which one was what was that road? Berlin Heights. Berlin Heights Road. Yeah. yeah. That was put in years and years ago. It finally the residents finally took it and uh, wanted us to take it over, which was in the contract when they built the development. And then they took in um, we went up there and tested uh, board the road. And it but, the standards. I wasn't here then. They had just taken it over before I came. Uh, they had met the standards, so we took it over. And then, well, well, Jeff came to me right after you hired me here and wanted me to go down and look at it. 
and when I went down there, the, the road was way lower than the lawns. Yeah. So I told them, I said, they're going to have to do something about that. That's right, too. I remember that. So they put on six inches more of gravel and got the road up so it was up above the lawns a little because it was just going to be a, a pond or what it was going to be. But I mean, what I envisioned being the problem would be the, the, the people who build out on a private road with no thought to having the road up to a standard. Right, but that's not a class four to class three road. That's a different right. we already own the road there. Yeah. Right. right. That's yeah. I'm I'm talking specifically like I thought this discussion was on the class four to class three upgrade. Um I think we have um I guess that's what I'm asking. You know, um yeah. you know, how do you, how do you want to handle that? I mean I think um, that we have some of these class four roads in town that people could develop on where if we're going to allow them to develop, we either, I mean, I just don't. I was thinking what I would do, because, and I need some help with this, that I would send you what is in the VTrans Orange Book, on, on which I think is quite helpful. Mm -hmm. um, and, but there are some decisions that the bo you as a board would need to make. Well, I think it's important in, the, in going from class four to class three is that the zoning people make it clear to the people building on those roads that it'll be up to them to bring it up to a standard. And I think that's great that we have a liaison now to that committee. I mean, that would be a big help. So, mm -hmm. but to me, that's the important thing is it so that the town doesn't, I you don't agree. have these build outs and then the town gets hit with, hit, hit with a bill on the, on the road. Well, and that's why I was thinking of it. The, reason, the specific reason for dwelling units for mm -hmm. distance would be an example would be like a black road where it's really minimal. But if somebody were to build four or five, six houses out there, it would probably make financial sense with the revenue you would generate from the taxes. And as a builder, um, it makes those properties more valuable. You know, just being on a class three road, you'll sell them quicker, you'll develop more. That's all I was thinking. Just with using, I mean, obviously, that's why I was thinking of a distance. Obviously, if it's a mile of class four road yeah. with three dwelling units at the very end, yeah. it doesn't make sense. And that's why I wanted a specific number in there. I thought a well, or a certain density. Yeah, that's, density. that's what I thought made sense. That's I what, think that's they do use density here. Yeah, yeah. Three density. lots or six dwelling units, something mm -hmm. like that. Yeah, yeah. Be, so we, sh we should try to at least keep it uniform with that, I would think. Yeah. Because, yeah. I mean, the road I'm thinking of is, uh, we had a discussion on it a little while ago with West Hill, over to where Benji is. Yep. From over through, because there was, Somebody was putting in a camp, and somebody was putting in a really nice camp, and you know, on I West Hill, on West Hill, yeah, West Hill. just beyond. Uh, well, who was it? it? Was the last house? Um, Wilcox. Yeah, that? Wilcox. Yeah. Well, he's not the last house now, but yeah. But I mean, we, we did have that discussion about that up there. Yeah, because they they came and asked me if it was a trail or a class four. Yeah. Is it still a class four or is it a trail? I think it's a trail. Yeah, they, they, it they downgraded it and blocked it off because they right. didn't want people out. Mm -hmm. Right, so the trail. But even, even so, the, there was somebody who built a camp out there, I believe. Well, he wants to. Yeah. He came and talked to me. Yeah, okay. He wanted to know what he'd have to do to get it so that the town would maintain it. And I said, well, that's something you're going to have to talk to the select board about. Yeah, see, there's, but that's a trail, not a class four road. Yeah. So that's, I mean, I think we need to work on one, you know, like there's very well, different policies. You, you must have been here when they built the house on the other end over by Benji's. Is that, there's a house up in there. Yeah. And on the other end of that <laughs> yeah. trail. I, I, was, I don't know. Yeah. I didn't realize they built a house on that end of it. Oh, yeah. Really nice place. Yeah. Huh. Put in a wicked culvert. But you see, you see, now there's where, uh, you know, if another house goes on that road out there a little bit further, then we're going to start having, you know, then we'd have to look at it as whether, whether the town should take it over, but who should take and bring it up to the, some minimal standard. Right. 
And that's, but that's, again, I think that's more in line. That's a thrown up road. It's not even an existing road anymore, so that is would it, fall into the new development because it's a trail, right? The trail yeah. is, is still the town right away. Still the town right away, but it's no longer, it's not. The class four roads can be upgraded to a class three road according to the state standards by saying you want to be upgraded to class three. I think it, where it's a lot different with a trail or a new development. I don't know. I think you can upgrade a trail fairly easy. Because it didn't take us much to get downgrade. Well, that I don't know, but I'm sure. Well, I think the place to discuss it is in the, when someone comes in for a permit. Yes. You know, and yeah. to get it. So, so I just, I am, I am working on that, and so. Well, has that been given to the planning commission or developer? That's zone? almost my next, yeah, so that's, that's my next place to have a, you know, I have talked to them, but I haven't given there's another there's another road on west hill that i got a call on a couple weeks ago um it's you know where armin bushard lived after he sold the farm yeah that road that goes out through there that was a town road at one time a long time ago i guess yeah, is that the one that goes over to the Loney property well it, it used to go right over and come out on cox brook yeah and they called and wanted to know why we're not maintaining the culvert in that road. Well, it ain't been a road since I've been here, so. Yeah. Well, class four, fortunately, is, uh, is we don't have to worry about it too much. Because Fitzhugh's got his, all that land up here for sale. Yeah. And I think that's what they're, that's why they called to find out if that's, the town's going to maintain that culvert that goes across that road. But I don't know if it's a class four or, or they downgraded it to a trail. But I can remember when I was a kid, my father and us would come from Cox Brook over through on the West Hill. The one right up where you used to live on Cox Brook, whatever the name of that road is. Mike Doney lives up there now. Oh, yeah. Is that called Wheeler Road? No, it's uh, my cousin Roy lives on that road too. Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, anyways. Yeah. So I just thought I don't know if, because they might be somebody might be interested in buying some of that land from Fitchu up there or something, and they want to know if the town's gonna maintain, maintain that culvert that goes across there. We have a map that shows um, that V Trans provides and. We can look, yeah, see yeah. what stat of the status is. So I've got a few. I'd like to just kind of go over the items that I've had pending, and uh, COVID nineteen hasn't helped them much. Um, <laughs> so, and this one, Raoul Hill Road. Um, I was always under the impression that both of the ends were class three and the middle section from Wells down to the bottom of the hill, I guess, was a class four. Yeah. And we opened it up during um, the summer. summer. Um, I heard from the <coughs> state this year saying that they've been giving us credit for a class three road right through. Um, well, when I was when I was here before, we never maintained it. Yeah. And then when I came back this time, they told me that they only maintain it once a year, and it, and it's closed during the winter time. So there and is a process to fix that, the reclassification. Good night. Good night. <laughs> Um, was it something I said? No. <laughs> there is a, to refix that, um, so that it, it, the records are right, unless we make it a class three, and I'm sure there's some provision that we can close part of a class three, there was one like we're doing on co co um, right. trail. Yep. Um, so that's, that's that. The town center designation is um, going forward. I must be him. We're on a roll, baby. Yeah, I'm on a roll. <laughs> I know how to clean out a room. <laughs> um, 
anyway, um, the town center designation, you're aware that the um, consultant's been working on it and has been soliciting people to give input on the on the on the uh, on her web page and so that's going forward that is a grant to pay for her that's coming through the state and we do have 22,000 in our budget toward that um, lovers lane bridge i have not done anything further since the beginning of covid on lovers lane bridge um, so if we're going to do something, I mean, obviously it takes money and, and so forth, and I can get, we just re really need a new deck on Lover's Lane Bridge. It's not, the stringers are fine. Um, so I thought maybe I would just go ahead, and I've, I've said I'd do this before, but then everyone wasn't available to give me prices, so I will do that. Uh, tax stabilization, I think it was Justin had expressed an interest that maybe we should look into that to upgrade it and work with the Economic Development Committee to review? Yeah, I don't know that the policy really fits the need of the town. I think that... I think that's what you said, yeah. Think yeah, there's... okay. So I will go forward and, and approach them. Sure. Um, the wall in the clerk's office. Um, that was the wall, maybe that's where Tim left, that Tim, <laughs> Tim backed into. And um, we had an estimate from a contractor that we called in of 28,000. The insurance company sent their adjuster and their figure was 21,000, I mean 23,000. And with the, the deductible, et cetera, et cetera, it, it was, they were gonna pay us about 20,500. Um, and the insurance company says, you should put that out for bid, which I agree. Um, I haven't because there, it was no sense to it. But should I go forward with that? Um, well, we got to take it the building structure was sound. You know, right. I mean, it was it was inspected that the building is safe. So I mean, that's yeah. I'm not worried that the building is going to fall down. But I put that short piece of wall. Right. So we had talked a little bit about maybe doing some things, but I think for now I'll put out an RFP for sure. the work. Uh, Colby Cemetery. The lot line adjustment. Um, Mr. Satan, Staten? Slayton, Slayton, Mr. Slayton, um, had offered to give the town the land needed to straighten out the property line, and so it would acquire more. Um, we had gotten an estimate for the survey, which was quite a bit, and we were going to put that out for bid. And shall we continue with that? Again, that's that's not a cemetery that people are dying to get in anymore. I mean, it's, it's not well, really crucial at this point, is it? Well, that's what I, I'm, I was yeah. just going to ask that same thing. And, uh, and the fact that if you the only it. crucial thing about it is, and I I don't know how to word this nicely, but Mr. Slayton's an older gentleman, and you know, you don't know. Well, the, the other on the other on the flip <laughs> side of that is you you stop and look at it. If he donates that land to the town, it comes off the tax rolls. Right, I don't, uh, yeah. I'm not saying it's a lot of... Money. I see what you're saying, yeah. Uh -huh. So, shall I just let that one slide, slide for a while? Okay. Richardson Road, um, since it's my understanding that we're not doing any adjustment to the FY21 budget, we should go forward on Richardson Road. Well, I think that's important that we get that uh, culvert fixed. I agree. We've got residents out there that depend on it. And you look what happened to Fisher Road. Yeah. And uh, finally, um, you did approve the paving on Fisher Road. They haven't done it yet, so we're, I'm waiting with bated breath for them to do it. Um, a lot of people are starting to angst over it. And. Um, well, I see the signs are up, the that, that's right, are up. Yeah. Are up. For the, being closed. The, uh, that would be Payne Turnpike North. They've put signs there effective July 8th. They're going to close the road during the day mm -hmm. for the sewer project. Mm -hmm. And uh, Tom has done a pretty good job getting the word out, and he will continue to do so, um, so that everyone is, emergency services especially, um, it will be closed from the 
school to Fisher Road. Now, people that live down in Richardson or in on Payne Turnpike, they can get in and out. They won't. Yeah. But, but it just they, saves a logistical when, nightmare when with did, traffic. When uh, did SD say they were going to do the paving? Uh, SD is supposed to do the paving. It was supposed to be as soon as possible, and they were going to do it immediately when you approve it. Um, today, they told me that they were going to be mobilizing any minute now. Okay. <laughs> but, I mean, has, has, has anything been put out about closing Fisher Road? No, because I didn't know when they were going to do it. Um, which I told them I had to know, so I oh, could, you know. The ST must have some of those place boards. The I'm, I'm sure they do. I mean, I like to put it on front porch forum and, right. uh, you know, even just give me a chance to yeah. get it out there, mm -hmm. especially well, since the hospital and, you know. Yeah. Well, I mean, if ST can, uh, if ST paving can um, give you a heads up, you know, it's a day. Right. We can, we can make an effort to let people yeah. know. And again, but, they should be done in a day. But if they, Since they if don't they have to contend with traffic. If, if they, I mean, they're going to have to put up detour signs and everything else anyway. Yes, yeah. yeah. So, the thing that's worrisome, though, is uh, ambulance access. Well, and again, I mean, last time that when the road failed, um, we notified everyone and I called Montpelier, especially the Montpelier ambulance, to, yeah. you know, advise them that they'd have to go around or come from the other direction. Um, and that was fine, as long as they knew. Yeah. Yep. That's all I have. Thank you. Okay, thank you, David. Is there anything else? Um, uh, okay, uh, round table questions? I'm just curious when we put out uh, the RFP for roadside mowing. That's usually done um, soon, middle of June. So it should be. I'll talk to Tim about that. Okay. Hello? Nothing. Thank you. Um, I've noticed here in Berlin, we, we tend to add a lot of agenda items at the beginning of the meeting. Um, some of them I think we probably know about on Friday. I think it'd be a good idea to try to get them updated at least into the draft agenda on Friday and that way if someone has um, particular thoughts or wants to join the meeting they'll see it on the agenda over the weekend. I, I agree and I'll do the very best I can. Okay. You know, um, there are times when... I like the CB um, fiber thing for just as... Well I tell you the CB said. fiber thing was, was interesting because if you remember uh, when that came, uh, it, they had only suggested that Brad sign it. And I was thinking they wanted it back by Friday. So I wasn't going to put it on the agenda. I had emailed select board members and, and asked them if they, were, they had a consensus to do it. Um, I knew that you were in favor of it. And I, Flo had sent me an email on it. I talked to Brad. When you sent me the email on Friday, I thought that you were saying to me, I'd rather have it on the agenda. So oh, yeah, that's I, kind of, you know, maybe that's my fault, John, but I, uh, that's, that's, what, that's what happened with yeah, that. Yeah, no, that was just one example. Yeah. And it wasn't that I was in favor of it. It was that I wanted it on the agenda for us right. to discuss on whether or not we wanted to sign it. And the tree tapping, I guess sometimes I hear from people and and maybe, you know, I'll try and do a better job, make sure I keep track of the time, but there are times, sometimes on Thursday, I've already done the agenda. And even though I haven't sent it until Friday. Um, so I'm not, I can't remember when he called me, but I wanted to ask you about it. Yeah, no, I, j I just want to make sure we have as much on there as possible. But I hear what you're saying. I think that people has... who have interest, of course, would like to know, be able to know. Sure. That's it. I have nothing I'll entertain. Anything in executive session? Uh, I have no executive session. I am waiting for signatures from you on the letter, uh, which is on your desk on the, on the, on the, toward me. Yeah. Dana, we have a meeting on. Wednesday. And we do have a meeting on Wednesday at 5 30. And that's here? Yes. Mm -hmm. 
Motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor, make sure you sign the uh, warrants before we leave. Thank you. Aye. Aye. All in favor? Aye. Aye.